Hey everyone, this is Oscar from Underdog and today let's talk about minimalism in electronic music and specifically what are the four magic ingredients that separate something that's boring and underproduced like this from something that has some nuance and some subtlety like this. When fundamentally the musical ideas in both are not that far away from each other. They're basically boom tsk boom tsk right? Variations on the backbone beat that underlies all techno and house. So what makes one clearly amateur and one, well, less amateur, let's say. I would say there are four ingredients. I'm going to list them now and then we're going to jump into Ableton and actually look at them in detail. The first step is make sure that there is a groove happening at all levels of your track. So in the lows, in the mids and in the highs. And a groove is slightly more than just drum hits. It's at least two elements that are bouncing off of each other in some interesting way. And the second rule is movement. Build in movement into each element. We'll look at some strategies on how to do that. But in general, you can remember that no movement is boring, too much movement is exhausting, and just the right amount of movement is interesting and stimulating. We'll look at some ways on how to generate movement and then also what to do when you go a little bit too far. The third concept that you want to incorporate are polymeters, basically including loops that are not clean multiples of one bar, which create an endlessly fascinating mathematical problem for our brain to solve. And so we can listen to something fairly simple for a fairly long time, as long as it includes one or two polymeters. And then lastly, remember one of the core foundational concepts of music is tension and release. So you want to build up tension and release that tension. And so a simple way of doing that in minimalist music is by simply building up all the frequencies, creating a wall of sound almost like white noise and then cutting that to create space between elements so that the purity of each element becomes clearer and as part of that especially in minimalist music don't be afraid of making your audience wait let them get more invested in your music before giving them any kind of payoff so there we have it four concepts let me show you them in practice in ableton now i've also arranged them into a poster which you can download in the link below if you end up printing the poster send it to me personally on discord i'd love to see the posters that i've done out in the wild Anyway, like I said, let's hop into the DAW and look at what some of this looks like in practice. Whoa! All right, cool. So like I said, this is our not a groove, right? So... All this is, is a 909 core kit with just me triggering the basic drum pattern that you should probably be familiar with. And if you're not, get familiar with this because it's the most basic drum pattern in house and techno that you can find. And a lot of electronic music can start with this pattern and then make variations to this pattern to get to more interesting places, right? But we're just gonna work with this pattern. Let's make this a little bit more sophisticated using the rules of minimalism. So the first rule was make sure that there's always something going on in the lows, the mids and the highs, and that something should be a groove. So not just individual drum hits like click, 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 click. No, we want something that is a bit more sound designed and preferably two elements that are bouncing up against each other. Can be in a subtle way, but it just makes not every hit identical. So for example, let's move into a counter example, which I'm going to call the yes groove, right? Let me solo that. In fact, let me solo just the kick. So the kick is just a different sample. I like the sample, but this again is not a groove, right? It becomes a groove when we add in a secondary element like this. You notice the difference. It's a subtle difference, but it's very important. These small additions will make that the ear has a lot more to hang on to, okay? We can do the same in the highs. Here's a hi-hat. Okay, let's turn that into a groove. See? See how there's so much more rhythm in there? So much more for the ear to orient itself. Now let's add a clap. And let's add a little bit of mid groove. There we go. So see how far away this is from See how many small nuances there are, even though it's basically the same musical idea. 
this is like day one you open up Ableton and this is after a few years when you've got some better intuition and you start making things that have some groove to them. Cool, so that was rule number one. Sound design your lows, your mids and your highs to have a groove, not just individual drum hits. Now the second rule was movement. You create movement in the timbre of your elements. There are many different ways to create movement, but some are using effects that have modulation built into them, specifically things like phasers, choruses, or flangers, or delays where you use an LFO to change how fast or what the pitch is of the delay or something like this, so that every time the effect happens, it's a slightly different outcome. You can also tweak filters, you can tweak envelope lengths, and basically any parameter that changes the timbre of the sound can be changed this way. And then you can use LFOs or automation to introduce those changes. So for example, I made a simple hi-hat pattern here where I just played four sixteenth notes like this. And can you see that there's already some movement in there because of the automation that I did on the envelope over here and on the frequency over here. If I would deactivate that movement, let's see what it sounds like. Not terrible, not, not terrible, but slightly less alive than, than this. If I activate automation here by hitting A, you can see exactly what I did here. Just some tweaks over time. Now, then I can add in uh, a weird effect like this one that adds in a flanger, right? And that flanger is set to very, very drastic settings and very slow changes. So that it just kind of evolves over time. And there we go, we've got a sound that moves. Does it move enough? Well, there is a sweet spot between enough movement and too much movement and too little movement. Let me show you what to do if you cross over the border and you go too far and you add too much movement into your sound. So, for example, here is a simple clap, right? It just goes like this. Very simple. But I've added in a delay. And what this delay does is, you see here, the LFO. The LFO is affecting the delay time. And when that delay time changes, then the delays get pitched up and down to create kind of this pushing, pulling, swirling feeling. And that can be very distracting if you put this in a song. I mean, very quickly, this is going to get overwhelming, right? But that's not a bad thing. We can go here, right? What we can do is we can right click this, we can do freeze track, and then we can flatten it. And then all of that movement, all of that wild movement, you can see it printed right here. And so what we can then do, I already did it a little bit before, right? Um, what we can then do is we can double click on it and select any part of it and loop that. So we can select a part with some movement and find the one that actually would match our song well. So this bit would have movement built into it, but it wouldn't be changing all the time. It would just loop over that movement again and again. For example, you see this? This is, this is a particular type of expression of this clap that you wouldn't necessarily get if you automated it consciously, but it's pretty cool. So you can take any part of this, layer it into your drum loop. And so basically you've created a sample that has movement baked into it. So imagine we've taken a section, we've moved it over here, and let me play the groove. And then we add in that looped clap. There we go. A whole new layer of movement that I wouldn't necessarily have programmed like that if I had had to program it in as individual hits. But it's got a lot of movement to it, and that sounds quite lush. And because repetition is the best way to learn, remember, not enough movement is boring. Too much movement is exhausting. The right amount of movement is interesting and exciting. Now let's move on to part three, the polymeter. You may or may not have heard of a polymeter before, but if you look at our groovy loop, which I've copied across the timeline here, it is exactly one bar, right? In some cases, it's even half a bar. But one thing that we know for sure is that every bar, this loop starts again from scratch. Every one bar, every four kick drums, this thing is identical, right? It's never gonna change. 
that is fine. It's very consistent, very groovy. It's going to work great on a dance floor. However, it's also going to be a little bit boring. So what we're going to do is we're going to add in an element whose loop is not exactly one bar so that it doesn't always start at the same point of the bar. Let me bring up an element that I've prepared earlier. This here is a polymeter. And how do you know it's a polymeter? Well, when you zoom in and you look a little bit closer at where the loop restarts, you see that these little lines here, the ones that indicate where the loop starts, well, they don't line up perfectly with the ones above it, right? So that means that this one little chord hit that I'm doing in this, uh, at the start of this, this polymeter loop, it's not going to line up with the bar exactly. And so that gives the following feeling. Try to notice, try to count in the core groove where the one is and notice that the polymeter never quite lines up with it. Well, sometimes it does, but then it diverges, goes off on its own adventure and then comes back. Very cool, very cool. And so to create a polymeter, all you need to do is you create yourself a MIDI track and you zoom in and you make sure that your grid size is something like 1 16th and you select uh, a length that is not one bar. So this would be one bar. So imagine I do one that's this length. You do command shift M or control shift M, which creates uh, a little MIDI clip and you can play a note there, like it could, you could play anything. Imagine quickly I put a little drum kit on there and just make sure that I'm playing a rim shot. Now when I stretch out this MIDI clip, it's going to automatically loop. And as you can see, these loop markers don't exactly line up with the one bars above it. So that's going to create that polymeter. And so what does that feel like? Right? It's slightly unstable. And so what you can do is you can then experiment with different lengths of this polymeter simply by grabbing the loop brace and dragging it in or out. And as you can see on the timeline above, that spaces those notes out longer if you want. And you can do this with percussion, you can do this with synthesizers, no matter what. And you probably don't want to load too many polymeters on top of one another because then it gets a bit chaotic. But one polymeter is almost always welcome. Two polymeters is probably still fine. But above that, maybe it gets a bit crazy. And so you find a rhythm that suits you and then you can sound design the element. Like before, you can put some movement on there. You can use some delays to turn it into a groove. In the example that I made there, I got myself a simple silent patch that doesn't do much. I can modulate the filter cutoff here. So that's definitely something I can do by hand or I can automate it. Imagine I do it like this, quick automation. And then those decisions, they get smeared out using this delay. This is kind of like in my painting with sound tutorial, if you haven't seen that, highly worth watching. And then adding in again this modnetic, I love modnetic, no, no affiliation by the way, I bought this using my own money. And it's just a kind of a delay with a lot of modulation built in. And so this one slowly builds up energy and releases energy. You might not hear it right now, but over the course of like 20 to 30 seconds, it creates this evolving feeling, which is going to build up tension and release. Ah, there you can hear it coming. You hear that? That's magnetic doing that. It feels like the urgency is building up and then subsides afterwards. Very cool. Another cool thing about polymeters is that they can last for ages in the break. Because imagine you've got yourself this track and then you remove the kick. You remove the hi-hat, you remove the clap. Now all you've got is this polymeter. And because it doesn't line up with the one, people on the dance floor are going like, oh, where was the one again? When is the kick gonna drop? It's not so obvious, right? And then, of course, you have to bring it back at some point. Let's see if I can bring them all back at the same time. How about like, yeah, there you go. The release then is quite satisfying because people are always, their brain is involuntarily trying to puzzle where the one is going to be. And so leaving that polymeter run during the break, very satisfying.
And so rule number four is tension and release. Just like all music, you have to have some kind of tension and release for your storytelling to be satisfying. So what I've done is I've simply taken the loop that we had constructed, duplicated it and removed almost all of the percussion to create space for that polymeter to build up tension, really make them wait, especially in minimalist music. You don't need to immediately give a payoff. You can really tell your audience, we're going to wait now for a while. You're going to wait for the payoff and they get emotionally invested and then the payoff is so much more sweet. Another way of building tension and release is taking any kind of sound. For example, this sound, super random sound, right? I've added a huge reverb to it. I've frozen and flattened that so that you get this big audio file. And then you just take that audio file and you reverse it. Like you double click it and you go down here and you hit reverse. That's this little button right here. And then you can place it in your composition like this to build up a wall of sound. And I did the same with a clap, which creates this feeling. This is a reversed reverb tail. All the frequencies are playing and then you get some silence and then you drop a clean beat. So let's play this tension and release uh, from the start. Okay, fine. Okay, now the audience knows something's coming. They're excited. They're trying to count where the one is. It gets very confusing. You can make them wait even longer than this, but there we go. Cool. And then for this, uh, just because I actually tend to make techno that's not that minimal, I've re resampled the drum loop, the drum beat, and layered this in. So then together you get a bit more of an assertive beat. It becomes less minimal, of course. Huh? And then I also put in a little break beat at the end as a turnaround. So here we go. Go, here we go. One more drums here. Just those buildups, tension, tension, tension. There we go. If I can muster the patience to actually finish this, you'll find it on my SoundCloud. Follow Torque if this aesthetic is something that you might enjoy. So hopefully these four guidelines will help you create music that doesn't feel underproduced, that has some depth and nuance to it, even if it doesn't have very dense or complicated musical ideas behind it. Check out my Foundations of Electronic Music course if some of the things that I did here went a bit too fast for you, or if you'd like to learn in a more A to Z complete kind of a way. Come show us on the Discord channel what you did with this. Follow my techno project Torque on SoundCloud and Instagram below. Like the video, subscribe to the channel, and leave me a comment to let me know what other topics you'd like me to talk about. Have a look at one of my other techno-related videos right here. And until next time, stay producing, be good to one another, and take care. Bye-bye.